Now, oh, I think time to join our very own Clemency Burton Hill, who's in the West Arena foyer and giving us something of a sense of what we're going to expect in the second half. Thank you, Charlie. Yes, well, call me greedy, but I'm joined now by not one, but two conductors for the second act of The Mask of Orpheus. Martin Gravins, hot off the stage, and Ryan Wigglesworth. Martin, enlighten us. Why does this piece need two conductors on the stage? Well, it's a very complex uh, score. Harry often works with music in many, several layers, and three or four times in the piece, Ryan goes off at a tangent, taking a group of players with him, completely independent of what I'm doing, of my tempo and my expressive language. Very often he's, he's looking after a, a very rhythmic ensemble, continuum, it's called. Right, so you two constantly aware of what the other one is doing? Yeah, but, but like Martin says, we're independent, so there aren't many places where we have to actually coincide. We're not sort of having to constantly check where the other one is. I mean, there's sort of, within certain boundaries, we, we have freedom. To, to go our separate ways. Do the singers ever get confused? Which one am I supposed to be looking at now? There's only one time where Ryan takes the singers. The rest, which, which is good, you know, the singers, they've got enough to, yeah, they've got a lot to think about in this piece, and uh, they're doing incredibly well. It's a wonderful cast, yeah. and uh, the whole thing has been really quite an adventure to put together, but a, a very thrilling well, I've been Experience. talking to Philip Langridge, who, of course, mm. created the role of Orpheus in the original ENO production, and he told me that although it was something incredibly exciting to be part of, he's very proud of it, it was to date the most difficult, the most complicated thing he's ever had to learn. How have you found it, preparing it for this? Uh, I, I can see why Philip says that. It is very complex in, on one level, but on another level, it's, it's, it, once you've learnt it, it's actually very clear and very straightforward. I think it's, the, it's partly the scale of the thing. It's, it's on such a massive scale, which probably accounts for the reason it's not done so often. <laughs> but it, but it's, it, as Martin says, once you're actually into the kind of language and, and the, the way Harry uses intervals and the way Harry likes things to be expressed, I mean, actually, it's, um, it's come together remarkably easily. It has come together very well. I remember being... I was involved in the previous uh, London semi-staged... Uh, version. I, I was doing Ryan's role and it, it, it seems as though musicians now are, are so quick at assimilating mm. the demands that composers put on them that even the complexities of this score, they've taken very much in their stride. And it helps having this wonderful orchestra, of course. Lastly, very quick question. It's the 75th birthday. Bert Whistle, you both know well. Uh, what does his music mean to you? I think he's a, a profoundly original voice. Uh, uncompromising but uh, once you go with, the, with his flow, it's incredibly rewarding. Absolutely. I, I've known his music, it seems like, forever. And as a composer myself, being brought up in the north of England, I thought that's what composing was. So I've been, I've been very lucky. A wonderful role model. Thank you both so much. I'm going to let you go now and prepare for the epic that awaits us. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much for your time. Thanks. Back to you, Charlie. Thank you very much indeed, Clemency. Well, as I said a little bit earlier, there's a slightly longer interval than usual, so we've got a big setup for Harrison Burt Whistle's uh, second act, The Mask of Orpheus. Um, in the meantime, delighted to welcome back once again my, uh, my guest this evening, Gillian Moore, Head of Contemporary Culture at London South Bank Centre, and Steve Martin, the composer. Gillian, first, how would you define, you know, Harry Burt Whistle's enormous importance in British musical life? Well, I think he's... A hugely important figure and, and, and a hugely inspiring figure for for composers now I think um, you know there are moments in culture aren't there and, and in the 1950s in Manchester was a was a moment in British musical culture when you had Peter Maxwell Davis and Harry Burt Whistle and Alexander Gurr and John Ogden all studying in Manchester and they I suppose they they brought a kind of well particularly through Alexander Gurr a sort of draft of European modernism uh, which really pushed British music into a whole new world and he has absolutely held that vision um, of an uncompromising and yet a very stark and bold music for all those years I think it's um, I think I think there's this European thing but there's he's also it's also a very English kind of music he's very it? English and I, I was thinking that today when I was listening mm. to the to the, the, that love of landscape, that love of, of you know, folk traditions. I think that he connects, oddly enough, this sounds really weird, with Holst and Vaughan Williams, mm. both of whom were just very, not very European. They were interested in, well, 
they were actually trying to make uh, specifically English music because German music dominated the whole of Europe, really, I suppose. I mean, Elgar was a very German composer. And um, I think that Boat Whistle, with the landscape, as you say, and the interest in ancient things, uh, folk things, uh, and theatre, Elizabethan things, uh, makes them very English. Also, this modal sort of music, it's not tonal, it's, of course, as most people know, very, very dissonant. Uh, but in fact, it's not like European, that sort of European Stockhaus and Boulezian sort of music that people might know. Uh, it's sort of a very English version of, of something. It's just highly original, highly original. Gillian, maybe it would be useful at this moment if you'd just like to paraphrase the Orpheus story for us. The Orpheus us. story, well, which version would you like? I think there, is, there are loads of versions of it. Um, I think in broad terms, Orpheus is thought of as the, as the person who invented music, which is something that I hope we'll get to talk about more. Son of um, Apollo, um, in, in um, many of the versions. Um, he marries the beautiful Eurydice. Um, she dies either on their wedding day or shortly after, um, either by a, a, a snake uh, bite or perhaps being pursued by Aristeus, the evil beekeeper. Um, Orpheus does a deal um, with Chiron, the, the, the ferryman on the river Styx, that he's going to go down to the underworld and bring her back, which nobody has, of course, ever done before. But Chiron says you can only do that if you promise not to look back when you're bringing her back. Of course, he can't resist. He looks back and she's gone forever. She dies for a second time. And Orpheus spends the rest of his life going on and on about it. But was always says he's a bit of a bore, Orpheus, because um, he sings and sings and sings about it. And then he dies. Um, depending on which version you read, and there are several versions of his death and of Eurydice's death in this opera. He dies either by hanging himself, committing suicide, or being torn to pieces by the Maenads, the mm. women, um, or by having his head chopped off and it flows down the river, singing, still singing all the time. <laughs> well, find Clemency Burton Hill, who um, might be able to tell us how the stage is coming on. It seems to be coming along pretty well behind me. Lots of rearranging of mics, creating more space for that second conductor. In the meantime, I'm delighted to be joined by the librettist of the Mask of Orpheus, Peter Zinoviev. Peter, thank you for joining us. Why Orpheus? Well, it's quite a long story. It wasn't Orpheus to begin with. It was Faust. And the point of Faust was that one could invent lots of legends, there's lots of stories about him, and I could have it in lots of layers. But then we decided that Orpheus was much better. There's lots of stories about him, various deaths, various ways in which he, he married or didn't marry, died or didn't die, and um, the same about Eurydice. And it's all perhaps dominated by the, by the great myth of him going down to the underworld to rescue Eurydice. And I decided to make that into a dream. How did you hit upon the idea of presenting these varied, the, the myth, the different characters, each verse of the song, I think, represents something different? Yes. Well, lots of people say it's very complicated, but it, it's, in a way, a complicated secret. Um, it's a secret between um, the composer and me and between the production engineers and me, between the conductor and the composer, and it only, only needs to be revealed in the final thing. So the music is immensely complicated. The score reaches to the moon. And my libretto, I suppose, is complicated, but nobody needs to know it. And so the final published libretto is a rather pretty version. Looks complicated and looks nice, but is actually only clues to what goes on. It's unlikely that many of our audience will have seen The Mask of Orpheus because it's only had the one fully staged production. Is that very frustrating? It is. It would be marvellous if it was played often. Um, and indeed, that one production had to be cut by 20 minutes, so it's never actually been done in its, in its entirety. It would be wonderful if, if lots of people did it. It's a thriller, and that's the important thing. Um, forget all the complicated score and libretto. It, the story is very simple, and it, this second act where Orpheus imagines he, he's going across a series of arches and gradually has more dreams and more nightmares and suddenly wakes up to find that the whole thing is just a myth. And, and, it, and that's the end, so he kills himself, he hangs himself. And that's one of the ends of Orpheus. Peter Zanovia, thank you so much for joining us. What an honour. Really, really looking forward to seeing it. Many thanks. Back to you, Charlie. Thank you very much, Clemency.
Well, Gillian Moore and Steve Martland are back with me in the box. Now, I just want to clear something up um, in advance for anyone who doesn't know this work. It's a kind of piece of doubles or shadows or, or mirrors, in a sense. You'll see Alan Oak, the tenor, for instance, uh, portraying Orpheus the man, but Thomas Walker, Orpheus the myth, Christine Rice is Eurydice the woman, but Anna Stephanie is Eurydice the myth. Gillian, can you sort of talk us through what we're going to see and how that, that sense of doubling uh, manifests itself? I think the important thing to remember about this act, which is about 45 minutes long, is that it's a great big dream. And then that, that makes almost anything possible. So you have, you know, as you have in dreams, you have people who turn into other people. Um, it's about a, it's about a, a journey, about Office's journey to the underworld, which is expressed like an aqueduct. And there's a sort of psychedelic 1970s album cover type picture of an aqueduct with, and it's like the first arch is um, the arch of crowds, and then there's the arch of, he sees things through the arches, he sees weather, he sees dying, the arch of dying. And um, it takes us from the mountain of living to the mountain of the dead. And then about two thirds of the way through, there's this huge climax. And he suddenly remembers a, a battle he was in, Jason and the Argonauts. And he says, the king stands highest. And then suddenly he wakes up. And then you get his death at the end um, after you know, he, you, his death by None many. of that is very clear, though. Yeah. You have to read all that before you can possibly understand any of that. Can't you, can't you experience it or, or, or just, you know, lose yourself in it on a, on a purely abstract level? Those yes. It's, it's immersive. It's that an is, immersive That was experience. not a criticism. I, I saw the only stage production that Dino Gillian did as well, uh, which I, was the first attempt at something very complicated. Uh, I think it's a spectacle. That would be the best way of describing it. And that's not to denigrate it. It's a spectacle because it does have three different people, you know, mime puppet and singer for each role and things happening simultaneously on three different stages so the eye has got to try and get all these things so it's more like a circus where you might get four or five different acts doing the same thing some people up there I think it's a spectacle in that sense and it perhaps if it was described as such and explained as such it might be easier for people to just take it as it comes really it's a very dark piece, isn't it, Gillian? Yeah, I think the mood is the most important thing. It's this kind of nightmarish, dark mood, and that's really enhanced by the electronics. You have this, what's called an aura, which goes right through it, and then this voice of Apollo with this sort of made-up Orphic language coming across. That makes this extraordinary dark atmosphere. And then, towards the end, there's suddenly this ballet, electronic ballet. Everything stops. The orchestra, in, well, you'll see what happens. But they, they it's marked of, three minutes in the yeah, score. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And it's called the, the allegorical flower of reason for some reason, which is completely incomprehensible to me. But it's a ballet. Everything stops. And that's the sort of beauty of the electronic music. And then the end is just, it's very melancholy. We're talking about the English thing. It's got that sort of English tradition of melancholy music. And in fact, though, when you get down to the music itself, it's really rather, it's very simple. What's going on an awful lot of the time are long melodic lines, very often high up in the winds, doubled, sometimes right in the middle of the texture. And the other thing that's going on is the other kind of Burt Whistle favorite is this sort of idea of musical machines, kind of mechanisms like clockworks, which go right through the orchestra. And I mean, you can really deconstruct the music in that way. I think the, the problem is that it was probably conceived in the late 60s and the libretto is of its time 